Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I have Russell Cook here on the telephone. Uh, Russell, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. It's long and complicated, but actually sort of simple in a roundabout way. Uh, I'm honored to speak with you. Uh, and considering the 37 people that you've already interviewed on your podcast, uh, I've actually interacted in some way or another with about half of them, and they're really impressive people. Um, it's an honor to speak with you, but as I mentioned my email to you beforehand, I'd really rather not talk with you at all. I really don't have time for this. However, let me expand on that just a moment because you know what I meant by that, but your, your listeners don't just at the moment. Think of it this way. Uh, every one of us in our lifetimes, at some point or another, we've expected somebody to do a job for us. And so we go off and do what we need to do. And when we come back, we expect the job to be done, uh, done correctly and done timely. But there's times when we come back and see the what was supposed to be done, it isn't done. Uh, figuratively speaking, papers are strewn all over the place. The, the furniture is turned upside down and the person who was supposed to do the job is nowhere to be seen. And you look at this mess and you say to yourself, my God, do I have to do your job for you? I don't have time for this. And then you do the job anyways, because it has to be done nobody else is going to do it. So you do it reluctantly anyways. And that's what I mean by, I really don't have time for this interview, but it has to be done. And the, the person or the people or the entity I'm speaking of who haven't done their job, as you probably already know, and probably everybody in this listening audience knows, is the mainstream media, the legacy media in the United States. That's ABC, NBC, CBS, and the PBS NewsHour, the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Times, newspapers, the whole pile of the mainstream media. And they have not told the public half the story of the global warming issue. We probably all know that. And for me, this is the important thing uh, in contrast to your, your 37 other guests there, that they're really impressive people. I am no more than an ordinary private citizen, nothing more than that. I have no climate science expertise. I have no science expertise, but I have questions. We all have questions. And that's the, the one thing that I want to do is be a, a role model, for lack of better description, that ordinary citizens can participate in this issue by asking questions. We all should have questions about what's going on here, what's reported, or even just due diligence questions. If you don't understand something, ask questions. Um, it's your right to do so. It's the freedom of speech, which I can get into later, because this is the whole issue is global warming science issue is larger than the science itself. It's about freedom. It's about your right to ask questions. It's your right to question authority. And so I got into this in an utterly small way, way back, way back when I was uh, no more than maybe eight, 10 years old. And I, I don't remember exactly if the map that I saw in the classroom was either at my uh, Sunday school classroom or in my regular public school classroom. Uh, the reason I don't know about this is when I looked at the map, I saw Greenland and Greenland was labeled Greenland. So I asked the teacher who knew of my Viking ancestry, so that's why I'm thinking it might have been at a church Sunday school uh, room, knew of my Viking ancestry. We were all uh, Viking people uh, at that church, but maybe the public school teacher knew this as well. Anyways, why is Greenland called Greenland? It's all covered with ice and snow, it's white. That's what I asked as a 10 year old. Now, the teacher answered by saying, uh, well, your Viking ancestor, Eric the Red, was a bit of a con artist, it wasn't actually green. And since I was a little kid back then, eight or 10 years old, I just took that at face value, it sounded plausible. 
And when you really think about it, that's what the, the people who are pushing the entire climate issue want everybody to do. They want to take these things at face value, no matter what their proclamations, declarations, assertions are, accept it, don't question it. Now, of course, when you look back at why Greenland is uh, was green, we know from archaeological uh, facts that that place was actually was green back in the medieval warm period. My Viking ancestors farmed on Greenland. Uh, they buried their dead in what is now concrete hard permafrost to take a jackhammer to bury your, your dead people in. There's plant roots and tree roots and the, the permafrost. The place was green and it was warmer. So that was that was one of those things that you, you question. Now, again, with the, when it comes to the mainstream media, I'm old enough, I kind of hate to date myself that old. I remember back when the mainstream media actually was pretty much for the all intents and purposes fair and balanced. And uh, my family and I more or less, we, we watch for our national news you prefer to NBC News over, say, the most trusted man in the in the world, Walter Cronkite on CBS. We just like the NBC News, John Chancellor and uh, David Brinkley. And I forget what year it was exactly when John Chancellor, the last of the old school news reporters, uh, retired from NBC News. Our family switched to the PBS NewsHour, Robert McNeil, Jim Lehrer. And they were traditional news people as well. And that was in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, somewhere in that range. And we watched them. They had, they were known for their fair and balanced reporting. Uh, Soviet, uh, NATO uh, differences of opinion. Uh, Arab-Israeli differences of opinion. Republican versus Democrat. Um, all sorts of things. But what bothered me at a, a small little level was that in the late 80s or there after it, 90s, all the way up to 2000, really, it bothered me that I didn't see skeptic climate scientists on the PBS NewsHour. And um, where that comes from, too, another one of my, my questions, which the news hour should have questioned when it came up or any time afterwards, you might recall, everybody might recall, uh, in 1988, uh, Senator Al Gore, Senator Tim Worth, and NASA climate scientist James Hansen popped up. That was in the summer of 88 and said, and I'm saying this facetiously, they actually said much more detail, global warming, we're all going to die. And I, I can't tell you exactly when I heard that report, saw it in the newspaper, Newsweek magazine, which my parents subscribed to, TV news, somewhere. The first question, question in my mind was, what happened to global cooling? Because as most everybody who knows that year, most everybody my my age remembers, global cooling was all the rage in the 1970s, clean into the 1980s. The mere fact that Al Gore and Tim Worth and James Hansen showed up and said global warming and nobody said where's global cooling, right then and there, there should have been people saying, what's up with that? And that question stuck in my mind ever afterwards. So, uh, Russell, I just have a question here. Uh, I was not paying sure. attention to uh, the global cooling or global warming that much back then. But uh, do you remember, was there a little bit of a hi hiatus in between there where they weren't talking about global cooling or global warming? Or did they just switch almost? Not, uh... not that I am aware of. Uh, one of the persons that you interviewed, Tony Heller, he has uh, his vast collection of of global cooling uh, reports and all that, he actually pointed out, and I used this in one of my blog posts, which I can't think of which one it is at the moment, where right about in the late 80s, 88, 89, somewhere in there, because I actually used one of his uh, uh, 
Arizona Republic of all places screen captures where they, for some reason, they switched to global warming. That actually is a worthwhile, in fact, there you go, asking questions uh, to find out if there if there's a, uh, a distinct transition or if it just kind of was a gradual thing. Because that's what I remember. And so it was so abrupt to me. That's why I actually remember it as a distinct thing in 1988. Don't know exactly when, the summer, maybe the fall, somewhere in there is what happened to global cooling. And one of the reasons why I know of that from the time period, my own personal self, not just from you know, rereading news articles these days, it's another one of my distinct memories. In probably 1977, maybe 1978, it was in our middle school science class, and I'm pretty sure that this wasn't a discussion initiated by the teacher, but instead amongst us as students, because I don't remember the teacher being anywhere within this, that we were talking about the bleak prospect of uh, ice sheets spreading all the way down to where we were at uh, in the near, well, sometime near future. One of my classmates asked me point blank, was I worried about ice sheets coming as far down as where we were? Uh, and my answer was, I'm not worried. I'm pretty sure I can outrun a glacier. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to quit my job to become a, a stand-up comedian. Don't worry about that. But I remember that. And that was a standout amongst them. And it made them think. And the, the, the way they were thinking, no doubt, is you can use that right now these days. How is it that you would be imperiled from an advancing ice sheet if it takes basically centuries to come from Canada clean down to the middle of the United States? Well, mirror flip that right now to this elemental question. How can you possibly have climate refugees from sea level rise when, as so many people can tell you, that the the, the amount of sea level rise currently happening right now, it is happening, there's no doubt about that, is so small as to be barely measurable. Therefore, how can you have a, a refugee from sea level rise when you will be not able to differentiate whether that person is a refugee three or four generations from now from a person who's moved further inland in order to get a better job? Yeah, on that note, so what I like to say is uh, if eight inches of sea level rise since 1870 is enough to make you flee your home, then you must be living too close to the ocean because the sea, yeah. as you said, it's just not rising that fast. Uh, before we leave this a topic, though, the, from like 1988, uh, do you have any insight into that actual hearing in 1988 when there was stagecraft to make the room nice and hot where they didn't turn on the uh, AC? Yeah. yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit if you know the details? Sure. Sure, because <laughs> I'm actually still going on my uh, my timeline of becoming a skeptic on this. But yes, indeed, there, there again, that's an excellent question. And the people over there on the, the global warming side don't want you to ask about this. Supposedly, uh, if I remember right, it was uh, Tim Worth who confessed on a PBS uh, frontline, the Climate of Doubt program, I think it was, one of those, might have been an earlier one, um, to actually having entered the, the house hearing room where they were going to schedule that hearing and purposely leaving the windows open overnight so that the air conditioner the following day would have to work extra hard to cool down the room. Because no doubt those rooms, you see them, everybody's wearing a suit. I think I remember one of our people actually at one of those hearings, Roy Spencer or Dr. Michaels or somebody said, my God, this room is cold. It must be 57 degrees in here. But anyways, that, that's what Tim Worth confessed. It's online. You can find it. But later on, he actually denied doing that uh, when people asked him about that in the recent few years. And that was to make uh, James Hansen sweat with those beads of sweat rolling down his, his forehead. Senator Worth denied that just recently. So now there, that brings up a question there. Was he telling the truth back then or is he telling the truth right now? And if he's telling the truth now, 
why did he make that false statement back then? And if it was a true statement back then, why is he making a false statement now? That's the thing about, and as this is a larger overall overarching political question when it comes to the far left and, and Democrats, uh, why did they have to stage things? In that case, if the evidence was so compelling that the earth is warming, there'd be no need to right. either have the hearing in the middle of the summer, because that's the other thing they supposedly researched when the hottest day of the summer would be, and then essentially scheduled the hearing then. That may or may not be true, because those things are scheduled far in advance anyways. But apply that to other very controversial uh, political issues these days. There are uh, alleged uh, claims of hate crimes uh, against uh, uh, people of color, whatever that's supposed to mean. I happen to be of color myself. I'm just I'm kind of a really light pink color. <laughs> um, but my friend, uh, Facebook friend Bob Parks, uh, formerly of the um, um, Media Research Center, he has a website, entry after entry after entry of fake hate crimes. If, if the racism is so rampant, why would there be any need for a, a Jesse Smollett style fake hate crime. If there's uh, runaway evidence for uh, global warming, why would you have to stage a, a hearing at the hottest point of the year? On and on and on. I don't want to derail you there, but I think, yeah, I think you were getting to where, uh, uh, where you became a skeptic and how you have focused on what the media treatment of skeptics. Yeah. That's true. Essentially, yeah. uh, two reasons. Um, what happened to global cooling and why on the PBS NewsHour specifically are there not skeptic climate scientists? At my, at my gelbspanfiles.com website, I have a particular menu item up in the, the top on the home page of the ongoing count of the bias at the PBS NewsHour because it was in my mind around 2000 by that point in time that why weren't there skeptic scientists? I knew they were out there because I'd seen a report or, or something about them. And in actually April of 2000, uh, the, it was a joint program of, of NOVA Frontline on the public broadcasting system. It was called What's Up With The Weather. And they featured, that was the last fair, more or less, fair and balanced report on the PBS network about climate change, they had, amongst other people, Dr. S. Fred Singer. Uh, wow. I may have heard of him before then, but then there was no doubt I saw him on that program. He stuck in my mind because he asked perfectly legitimate questions about whether or not the science was settled. What about all sorts of other factors, natural factors contributing to uh, what little warming we see as opposed to it being catastrophic? Now, fast forward a little bit from 2000, in 2005 on the PBS NewsHour, they had an interview with Mayor Nichols, I forget his first name, of Seattle at that time. And he said that if uh, the Bush administration, George W. Bush, didn't move ahead with the Kyoto Protocols, by God, Seattle was going to do it for them. And since I knew of Dr. Singer, and I knew of the medieval warm period, and I knew of... Uh, what happened to global cooling, I just arbitrarily sent an email to Mayor Nichols' office and I said, well, what about these problems? And all I got back from them was a canned answer. And I have that in my email pile somewhere. Uh, it's, it reads pretty much like what you hear these days. The science has settled. It's uh, abundantly clear, rising oceans, uh, increased hurricanes, her, uh, tornadoes, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. And so what I did was I sent an email back to Dr. Singer, or not, not back to him. I sent it my very first email to Dr. Singer uh, to let him know that I had emailed uh, Mayor Nichols and got a reply back from him. And Dr. Singer's reply at that time was that, the mayor was grandstanding. Um, and that 2005, by the way, was only a year after Naomi Oreskes came out with her 100% uh, consensus, scientific consensus paper 
And he mentioned something about that. So that name, which is somewhat unusual, or risk is Naomi, <laughs> uh, stuck in my mind too, but kind of like in a, in a background thing. Then further forward from that, in 2008, one of my hobbies involves outdoor camping, four-wheel driving, and in one of their off-topic threads, uh, one guy mentioned, just out of the blue, I happened to surf across it, that we need to do something about global warming or we're all going to die. Since I knew of Dr. Singer, of global cooling, those things, I just put a flip comment in there to reply to him saying, well, what about these other things? And the guy responded that either I was a denier or a ignoramus or this or that. And I thought, okay, whatever, you're entitled to your own opinion, I guess. Didn't think much more about that. And then a, a, a couple months later in June 2008, uh, the same guy had a big long thread about understanding the results of global warming. It was just more or less of a diatribe against anybody who's questioning it. One of the things he said was, and I will quote this verbatim because I have this on my TV screen, my, my computer screen. In the late 1980s, internal memos from the Global Climate Coalition were published that included statements such as, quote, our goal is to realign the public understanding of global warming as theory rather than fact. This is well documented by Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Ross Gelbspan in his book, The Heat is On, end quote. Now, same thing. Uh, I wasn't thinking a whole lot about climate scientists, but I, I'm a stickler for details and have a photographic memory, I guess you could say. And so that awkward phrase, realign public understanding as theory rather than fact, Pulitzer Prize winning Ross Gelbspan, kind of just stuck in my mind and rattled around a bit. Fast forward to another uh, year to 2009, uh, where I'm at, our governor decided to put the state in participation with the Western Climate Initiative cap and trade plan. I wondered. Why? Uh, skeptic climate scientists say this is not a good idea. Does the governor not know about this? So I send an email to the governor and to the other people, because I had time on my hands, uh, the luxury of time, to the other participants in the Western Climate Initiative. There's a couple other states and even a couple of Canadian uh, provinces. And all I got, I never got an answer back from the governor here, but I got canned answers and it was the same thing. Signs have settled, uh, sea level rise, hurricanes, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking, why are these things sounding so similar? And so I wrote my first ever article for American Thinker on that. And that sort of was the thing that led me to write more articles. The following year, I wrote my next article for American Thinker because it bothered me so much that the news hour did not have skeptic climate scientists on its program that I wrote a piece about that. In researching that article, and in the month or so beforehand, I ran across uh, completely repeated talking points that you shouldn't give equal media treatment to skeptic climate scientists, just like you wouldn't give equal media balance, fair balance to Holocaust deniers or uh, people who deny the harm of tobacco smoking. And one of those names in there was Ross Gelbspan, who had that in one of his little speeches. And as a sheer coincidence, what I had done was I, in October of 2009, I reread what I uh, read to you verbatim from that one guy's uh, off-topic post about Gelbspan and the Pulitzer Prize and the realigning global warming as theory rather than fact. Literally within days, uh, less than a week, I also happened to read a thing at, uh, I guess he was a fired or, or dismissed a reporter from the Seattle Post-Intelliger, a guy named Robert McClure, and he had his own blog 
where he mentioned something about the news hour or whatever it was. I don't remember. So I, I commented at his blog, why is it that the news hour or the news media doesn't tell the world about skeptic climate scientists? And I kind of went back and forth with him uh, for a couple different comments. And then here's his exact quote where I was kind of hammering him on that point. He said, Russell, as I mentioned, and this is, comes from one of his prior comments, but he repeats it. As I mentioned, I don't have time for a protracted debate here. What I, I did see that the report that you referenced by Dr. Singer was not what I imagined. It takes issue directly with the IPCC. It's not a petition as I imagine I stand corrected. Oh, goody, I, I scored a point right there. But continuing, quote, the Elvis fan was only the first of many to document payments by the industry to a small group of scientists who consistently defend the interests of the industry reliant on not controlling greenhouse gas emissions. There's that name again, Gelbspan. So in October, December, I thought to myself, okay, who is Ross Gelbspan? And that Turns out what the, the phrase was reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. What is that? Where can I find that in its full context? And that's where, starting at that point, I tried to figure out what the full context of these so called leaked industry memos, which were supposedly so hooking gun proof that skeptic climate scientists were paid industry money to lie. It was in the news reports at that time, 2008, 2009, that I found from digging through the internet. One of the places I found it was um, in a uh, US News and World Report uh, on the then current Kivalina uh, versus Exxon uh, lawsuit. And what it did was it said that the quote came from Matt Wald, a 1991 article he wrote in the New York Times. Well, that contradicted other reports saying that it came from Ross Gelbspan. And so inside of quite literally the first day of trying to figure out who Ross Gelbspan was, okay, which, because it described him as a Pulitzer winning reporter and Matt Wald of the New York Times, who was first then because the different places said both of them were first. You can't have two reporters reporting at first. One has to be the second. From that point, it I found references and connection to reposition global warming as theory rather than fact as being the same thing as what the tobacco, tobacco industry did uh, when they had their memo saying doubt is our product. They wanted consumers to question whether smoking is harmful. This was a direct comparison to reposition global warming because they wanted the public to think that uh, climate scientists was not settled. I found the doubt is our product memo said it came from a 1969 uh, Brown and Williamson uh, big long uh, memo, multiple pages. I found that probably within I don't know, 15, 20, 30 seconds of doing an internet search for that. For the reposition global warming as theory rather than fact memo set, it took me seven months before I found that, that those memos and what would essentially be their complete context. And the only reason why I found the, those memos at all is because I finally figured out that the name ozone action was connected with Greenpeace. And the reason for that, and I have that in one of my uh, uh, Gilbspan Files uh, blog posts, was that a, an Australian activist named Sharon Beter, B-E-D-E-R, uh, mentioned that the reposition global warming is theory rather than fact memos were first exposed by ozone action. But when you used her links or other people's links for ozone.org, it came up blank. It was no such site at all. And I couldn't figure that out for the longest time. But then finally, somebody, I know, it was, <laughs> I forget some of these details, but then they come back to me. It was uh, Dr. S. Fred Singer in one of his The Week That Was 
uh, newsletters that uh, mentioned it when I was digging through where that phrase was or who Gelbspan was or other things. He mentioned that ozone action was going to be merged into Greenpeace USA in 2000. The head of Greenpeace USA, who took over because Greenpeace at that time was really bleeding uh, donations and membership because they were kind of had no particular direction to go and how they saved all the whales. John Passacantando, another one of those long and unusual names, Passacantando, was the head of Greenpeace USA. He came from Ozone Action. He was the founder or co-founder or co-creator. That whole narrative is inconsistent. I can tell you about that later. Uh, he merged ozone action into Greenpeace. And so once I figured that out, I was able to do a search using also Greenpeace in the, the Boolean search where you have to do specific uh, efforts to put things between quote marks in order to make Google narrow down its searches and not give you super, superficial irrelevant trash. And I finally found those memos. They were buried in uh, Greenpeace's quote, Greenpeace research, or Greenpeace investigations, I'm sorry, uh, uh, section where they had all kinds of memos and documents and other things, which were supposed to be for people to use to for research purposes, but they never publicized that. And so from that point onwards, and I'll maybe stop in my timeline there, absolutely, positively, nothing added up right when it came to the accusation that skeptic climate scientists were in collusion with fossil fuel uh, industry executives to uh, engage in disinformation campaigns in which all, everybody, all parties involved, knew that what they were saying was false and bought and paid for by big oil. And the thing, turning to the next angle of this, it took me a long time to nail this down. I couldn't f figure it out within the first several years of writing my articles at American Thinker and Breitbart and other places. And, and ultimately uh, at my gelbspanfiles.com uh, blog, uh, I couldn't figure out for certain if these memos were genuine or they appeared to be genuine, but the the typography in them, in Greenpeace's scans, the, the one change from one to the next. And ultimately what I got corroborated absolutely using the help of the late Ron Arnold, uh, author of the book Undue Influence. He was a Washington Examiner article writer. He had the wherewithal and the ability to go and interview people where I, as an ordinary private citizen, I couldn't interview people. And so he interviewed former members of the Western Fuels Association, the place that put on the Information Council for the Environment uh, Public Relations Pilot Project campaign way back in 1991, uh, in, to which these repositioned global warming as theory uh, memos were falsely attributed. Ron Arnold got it confirmed that that memo set was something written by the Edison Electric Institute with the uh, whole bunch of various different proposals. So he found out that it was like a hundred page proposal with all kinds of stuff attached to it that they suggested uh, that this pilot project uh, public relations campaign could be targeted at older, less educated men and younger low income women. And they, they proposed this to the Western Fuels Association uh, Ron Arnold has it confirmed that the, the people at Western Fuels looked at this proposal and said, reposition global warming is what? We don't want to do that. It's, that's weird. And additionally, that they, they wouldn't want to target a, such a narrow demographic in their public relations efforts, older, less educated men and younger, low-income women. They wanted to target everybody. So they rejected that proposal straight out. Uh, I even followed up on that uh, more recently. I asked one of the, the former Western Fuels people if he remembered whatever happened to that set. And he said that eh, just like some of the proposals that the, the members uh, who belong to the Western Fuels Association, that's a, it's a co-op of, of uh, energy companies and the, the providers 
who mine and transport coal, it's a co-op, that they contributed material to the annual reports and they use some of it for their Western Fuels annual reports and some of the else of that, which was either not helpful or just extra, they threw in the trash can. And so he said, that repossession global warming is theory memo set, the whole thing probably ended up in the trash, just like some of that other unused stuff. And that fact right there, that that memo set was never implemented, wasn't even solicited, kills the, the majority of, of the 25, 26 current uh, global warming Exxon new style lawsuits because that memo set Reposition global warming is theory rather than fact. I urge your listeners to look it up with that phrase in uh, between quote marks, or it's one little variation of reposition global warming is theory, parentheses, not fact, close parentheses, and see how far and why that uh, accusation is thrown around where this is supposedly smoking gun evidence. It's in the majority of those Exxon new lawsuits as their cornerstone evidence of disinformation campaigns. And it is worthless because, think about it, if you're gonna have evidence of a disinformation campaign, you better prove that it actually happened. And if there was any proposal to it that that disinformation campaign actually happened, that people operated under that directive. When I first started out in this, I asked Dr. S. Fred Singer, Dr. Patrick Michael, Dr. Uh, Robert Balling, Dr. Sherwood Idso, through his son Craig Idso, did you ever see a directive demanding or, or telling you to reposition global warming? Every single one of those guys said they never saw that memo. I asked uh, some of the other people associated with Western Fields when I had the opportunity to do so, did you ever see this? <clears throat> None of them ever saw that. Uh, the one guy in particular, who was part of the advertising campaign. I actually talked to him on, on the phone back in like 2010, 2011. He said that he had to laugh at all that because he said, I cannot believe that they have made such a giant production number out of a public relations campaign that only lasted weeks. And it was so small that nobody ever saw it. But that same phrase, reposition global warming, that is in Al Gore's movie at the one hour, almost 13 minute point. And he uses that to compare against the doubt is our product, Brown and Williamson uh, uh, tobacco industry memo. He said, these two are one and the same. Naomi Oreskes, her first claim to fame before she wrote that Merchants of Doubt book he did an entire slide presentation on the Western Fuels Association, Association saying this memo said is smoking gun proof. And she had a bunch of other uh, items in her slide presentations, which I showed in one of my blog posts, is completely false. Uh, uncountable numbers of other people uh, attribute that memo set to Western Fuels only just recently and this is another mystery part here too, is uh, one guy who was a former uh, worker, employee or whatever at uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, <clears throat> or as Joe Bastardi said one time, the Union of Very Concerned Scientists, he actually got it partly right by attributing that memo set to the Edison Electric Institute, <clears throat> which I don't understand why that guy did that that started in 2017, but it could be because maybe somebody, somebody finally figured it out that by attributing it to Western Fuels Association, if they know better than that, then they're committing libel slander against Western Fuels. So it could be, I don't know this for certain, maybe that's why they've switched gears lately and trying to concoct this idea that, well, besides... Uh, the fossil fuel industry knowing electric utilities knew, put that in, in quotation marks or with the little hashtags, utilities knew. Uh, that could be why they're doing that. That's a mystery though. There, there are so many faults to this and this is the fundamental overall point I wanna make is that the deeper you look into just the accusation by itself 
that skeptic scientists are paid industry money to lie. Except that at a superficial level, it may be true, or sound like it's true anyways. In fact, uh, to illustrate that, uh, that actually happened to me my own self. Back in uh, 2008, let me go back to that little point there, uh, in that same uh, hobby interest uh, outdoors four-wheel drive uh, uh, website, uh, one guy mentioned that, uh, well, Fred Singer was paid uh, uh, $10,000 to tell lies by the oil industry. And I remember when I first saw that, I thought, dang, he sent, Dr. Singer sounds like such a trustworthy person. You know, 10 grand, oh my goodness, that's terrible. He must have been paid all kinds of money because he's still saying these things. And so, however, like uh, Ronald Reagan used to say, President Reagan, trust but verify. So in that particular instance, what I did is I took about two days, three days of my time during the middle of the day to find out if Dr. Singer ever actually was paid that kind of money. There's a kernel of truth to it. He was given a strings-free grant by Exxon, who that particular year also gave $10,000 to Ducks Unlimited. Yeah, right. Ducks Unlimited is spreading uh, disinformation about the climate issue, too, aren't they? And ultimately, that's all it ever was. Dr. Singer disclosed that his own self. But he held his position on the climate issue years before, years afterwards. And so did when you look at basically every other climate scientist in this issue who are skeptical, Dr. Willie Soon, uh, Dr. Patrick Michaels, uh, Sherwood did so. Dr. Sherwood did so. Every one of those guys had their same viewpoints that what little warming we've seen cannot be absolutely attributed to human activity, not 100%, before they were ever received any teensy amounts of money they got from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, Dr. Uh, Linson, Richard Linson, one time mentioned that he was given some kind of travel money to attend uh, some hearing because basically he didn't have any money to get where he was going. Like that makes him some kind of a crook. No, think about it. Corruption means that you hold one particular position. Somebody shows up with some kind of gift, money, uh, property, something, to make you change your mind, or not even that, just say something that you know not to be truth. That's what corruption is. And the Al Gore, everybody on down or from him, they hurl this corruption accusation, but they couldn't prove it if their reputations depended on it. Do you have any more points yourself that you want to make sure you make before I have, I have some questions also, but do you have any other major sure. points to make? Fundamentally, this is larger than the science because like even Dr. Soon said in, in his uh, podcast interview with you, that if only the politicization of this issue hadn't happened, then we wouldn't be where we are. I actually wrote a blog post on that titled, if I remember right, um, how President Clinton, meaning Bill Clinton, how President Clinton could have saved the world. And he was president at the time when Ross Gelbspan wrote his first book in 1997. And there was kind of a big media word, whatever that was, that while he was on vacation in Martha's Vineyard, he was reading several books and they were a yeah, novel or two or three and Ross Gelbspan's The Heat Is On. And to me, those were, I thought, a plant. Uh, they, they were already actually even a genuine news item. That was a thing to get other people to read or go look at Gelbspan's book, which had only just come out the prior April. I think uh, Clinton was vacationing like in September, October, something like that. Now, here's what could have happened if Bill Clinton had read Gelbspan's book on the inside book cover sleeve. It says Pulitzer winning Ross Gelbspan. If Bill Clinton had simply investigated that one little bitty point all by itself, and found out that Ross Gelsman never won a Pulitzer Prize, he might have started asking all kinds of questions in addition to that. For example, these scientists that he accused of uh, corruption, 
He could have invited them to the White House, Dr. Singer, Dr. Michaels, and uncountable numbers of other ones to say, well, what, what do you know about the climate issue, the science? And then he could have responded to reporters when they asked him, well, what did you think of Ross Gelbspan's book? They actually did ask him that question. That he could have responded, oh, yeah, that guy. He turns out he never won a Pulitzer. And it turns out that these other skeptics have quite a bit of valid uh, material to point out. And his accusation, Gelbspan's accusation, is actually any old country lawyer could figure out is completely without merit. That's how things could have changed. So my that point is, been. fundamentally, the mainstream media has not done its job to tell the full side of the science, and they haven't done a thing to investigate any single aspect of the accusation that skeptics are paid industry money to lie. So the more, that's why I don't have time to do this, but as the rest of us citizens we're going to have to find time to do the job for the mainstream media on this issue, all sorts of other hot topic, uh, controversial political issues. If they're not going to tell us the full story of things like Hunter Biden's laptop, we can ask questions about these things. No right or wrong answer, but when they're not going to answer questions, when they're going to suppress uh, news items from all varieties of ordinary citizens on up to places like the New York Post, if they're going to label us climate deniers, and if they're going to say, oh, DOJ should investigate people pushing misinformation on uh, the 2020 election, uh, January 6th, and climate denial, that puts a target on every single one of us where we're not allowed to ask questions. And this is paramount to freedom and democracy, we should be allowed to ask questions. So that is what this basically all boils down to. Very, very good. All right. Uh, my final question here is, uh, it seems like you've been involved in climate skepticism uh, longer than uh, almost all of us other climate skeptics, maybe before there was a, yeah, so way before there was a blogosphere or Twitter or, or uh, what's up with that. Um, do you have any major points you'd like to make about uh, what you've seen, maybe even just since the year 2000? Like, they did not even use the term denier until after that, I'm guessing. So just any major points you want to make about how things are changing or what you see right now? Yeah, um, denier. Uh, originally, that I assume that somebody somewhere, and who knows how the, the far left side of the, the political issue works. Uh, denier comes from Holocaust denier. <clears throat> you can ask questions about that. There's nothing wrong with that. However, if somebody was to walk up to me and say, how do we know the Holocaust happened? I could show uh, films from the Nazis, uh, the documents. I could do that all day long, proving the Holocaust most certainly did happen. Uh, <clears throat> you could turn that a mirror direction in the other way, where somebody will say something like, uh, how do we know that those things that went into the World Trade Center weren't actually missiles? And I could be stupid and evil and turn that around and say, well, you're just a 9-11 truther denier. That's what you are. No, I could, if they asked me, how could I prove those weren't missiles? I could do that all day long, uh, pointing out the, the, the problems with the 9-11 the truther garbage. Uh, and when it comes to climate, even like, for example, just recently, uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, is all the rage right at the moment because it's the 10-year anniversary of it. People could say, well, that was a superstorm, wasn't it? And I could say, well, no, I can pretty much all day long go find my various climate science friends. My email <laughs> contact list reads like a who's who list of climate scientists who could point out that Superstorm Sandy was hardly more than a category one hurricane when it arrived, but it combined with an inland uh, giant nor'easter uh, weather system and became a huge storm. Or uh, I don't see any difference in uh, climate situations from what I saw in the 1980s. The hurricanes are not increasing in intensity by, you can, I can find my various pals who can point that out, 
or even my own personal observations. There's this one uh, report, you've probably seen it, those cute little animals, the pikas, uh, that are like small little rodents that look like little rabbits, but they don't have rabbit ears. They live in the, the rocky slopes of steep mountainsides in uh, uh, southern Colorado where I go on vacation. There was a report I remember seeing where it said they're moving farther up the slopes because it's getting so much warmer. And I'm thinking, no, I've gone to one of the same places ever since the mid late 1980s. They haven't moved one inch up the slopes because of warming conditions. All these other claims of uh, more intense weather events and this and that. Tony Heller, who you've interviewed, he has a plethora of history reports where all you have to do is say, is that true? And go find reports from 20, 50, 100, 150 years ago that the climate uh, system, the whole weather events and all of that was as extreme or more than what's happening now. Uh, the other claim is the uh, urban heat island effect. Well, one of the large metropolitan city areas that I happen to be living in is warmer at night. Yeah, because there's more concrete everywhere. There's more pavement. So that aspect of it is true, but it's not due necessarily to human activity when it comes to burning fossil fuels, at least not directly. You can question all of these things. So I don't, the weather to me doesn't seem any different. Other, all sorts of other things too. There's hardly any change of it. The one article I found, which I thought was downright funny, and Mark Morano has uh, uh, quoted this one, the armadillos were moving south back in the 1970s because of cooling. Well, the polar bears are supposedly moving farther north and everybody else to the Arctic because it's getting too hot. These are patently ridiculous planes when you just take the time to go look them up. But like I mentioned in my email to you, Naomi Oreskes, I have no idea why she's involved in this issue at all, but she is one of the most famous ones, spokespeople there is these days. She's a favorite to appear at uh, house hearings. Her Merchants of Doubt book is in there, but there is no reason for her to be in this issue that I can tell from a legitimate uh, way because her initial stories of how she came to discover who the quote merchants of doubt were, Fred Singer and other ones, she can't keep that story straight if her reputation depended on it. And when you have people like that, Ross Gelbspan as well, the other accusers in this issue, when they tell a tale of how they got involved in this and their stories don't line up right, yeah, it seems like a lot of those people just get a lot of publicity because they are uh, following the narrative. And uh, they yeah, if you say the right things, yeah, if you say the right things, you get publicity. Okay, very, very good. I'm going to uh, uh, wrap this up then and uh, get this put online. But thank you for joining me. Thanks very Talk much. And it's an honor to have spoken with you. Glad to right. help people out to uh, find out more on this because once they have questions, the more of us who have questions and ask those questions and keep pressing it, the more likely this issue is going to fall apart. Very good. Talk to you later. Goodbye.